Okay. Um, well, I think I'll go ahead and, and uh, get started talking about stuff here for this week. So we're up to um, the instruction sets, characteristics and functions chapter here. So I believe that's chapter 12, if you're ninth and 10th edition or chapter 13, if you got like a newer one. Um, so yeah, I did, uh, um, oh, I didn't, didn't I? I forgot to post the solution, didn't I? Oh, no. Um, yeah, I, I forgot to post our solution here. I meant to do that. Um, I'm going to post that here so anybody watching can maybe take a look. But, uh, but yeah, I guess since nobody had a chance to look at it, uh, but yeah, if, you're, if, if you had some questions on the problem set from last week, um, I was thinking about talking about it a little bit. Um, So, although if anybody doesn't have any questions, because yeah, I know nobody really had a chance to look at the solutions, but um, of course, if anybody did work on the problems their own, they might've had some questions on them, so. Um, oh yeah, that ended up being a little bit big because <laughs> I, I put some pictures in there, so. Um, I, I don't know if, if um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of work to do on this one. Um, so I don't know if uh, I, I suspect most people won't find it all that difficult. Just there was there was a lot of things to do. So I'm sure my posted solutions for the digital logic um, problems, example problems, there's probably a lot of typos and mistakes here and there. So I'm welcome if anybody finds things or if you find something where your result is different and you're not certain, you know, let me know and we can figure out uh, whether I have a mistake in the solution here or not. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, um, constructing truth table is kind of a, a fairly basic sort of skill. Um, um, given an expression, um, so I did show using um, but you had to because you didn't really have the truth table here, although I guess you could construct the, the truth table from the expression and then try and do a Carnell map. But um, um, there are examples, hopefully I gave enough steps. I, I tried to do only one step at a time for applying the uh, Boolean algebraic expressions in order to try and uh, simplify these different expressions. So these are what I got. And again, I don't guarantee all these are absolutely correct, but uh, hopefully they are. Um, So yeah, I mean, you know, De Morgan's theorem is kind of an important sort of property. Um, so the third one really was kind of asking you to sort of prove it by hand or, or verify it for um, a slightly more general case. So a case where you have three equation, uh, three variables in your equation. So, but yeah, if, if you just draw out the truth table, you know, fill out the truth table, you should be able to convince yourself that um, it holds for three properties as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, um, I should have, I should have switched, um, question four and five because they're, they're similar. They're both designing a circuit starting from a description of a truth table. Um, 
So four was was with four inputs and seven outputs. So it was quite a bit bigger of a problem. Uh, I, I ran out of time a little bit. Didn't have quite time to build uh, electronic versions of the figures and things. So I had to throw in uh, kind of my hand drawn figures. Hopefully everybody can look at those and figure those out. So, but you, you know, these are the things that I got for the um, um, the simplifications. I, I mostly just use the Carnal maps to give examples. Um, but but yeah, somebody did ask. Or a few people asked, yeah, but you do have to do these for all seven of the outputs to do the full circuit. If you want to get practice on, you know, um, writing the uh, sum of products fo um, form and then simplifying it using Carnal maps, you got kind of seven examples to do that here. And hopefully I got these right. So these were what I came up with. Um, I kind of ran out of time. I didn't, I didn't show the full circuit. I did show the first three. Um, circuit design, I mean, all these would be similar, you know, the, the only thing you can get wrong is just to make a connections. And I did make a connection wrong on my very first one. I might've made some wrong ones here as well, but yeah, on, on the very first and this is supposed to be with X2 and X4, uh, but yeah, I, I connected it with not X4. So that one was supposed to be over there. So I need to correct that. Um, and yeah, there might be others, but um, there's an example of a circuit. But yeah, the gray code, um, if, if you haven't done these yet, you know, and you don't want to look at the solutions, but get some practice. The gray code is quite a bit smaller because um, it's three inputs and three outputs. So this is, a, this is probably a good one to start with, actually, um, because um, it also give you, if you go off and do the simplifications, it's pretty easy since the, since the um, some of products forms are relatively small. It's pretty easy to um, do the algebraic manipulations and come up with the um, um, the simplified forms on these, right? So, so it's a little bit easier to, to confirm with yourself or to do both of these. So try it with the Carnal map and try it with just applying the algebraic properties, the, the Boolean algebraic properties, you know, so. So one of these, the, um, the, the, the digit, the most significant digit of the gray code is pretty easy. It's basically true whenever the, 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 the first digit is true. So, so that one simplifies just down to uh, the first digit. Oh, by the way, in my solution, um, um, I didn't rewrite out the, the truth table, but um, I used uh, I used X2, X1, and X0 for the binary digits, but I, but I did it reverse from um, the way that they gave it to you, or the way that I gave it to you in the first problem. So, so they explicitly gave um, indexes one, two, three, and four for the most significant digit to the least significant digit. Um, I sometimes like for these kind of problems, um, um, I often like to use, you know, zero for the least significant digit because that corresponds to the power of the digit, two to the power of zero, right? So, so using X zero gives a hint that this is the, 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 the ones digit or the two to the power of zero. So this is X one or the twos digit, and this is X two or the fours digit here. Likewise here, although these really aren't, um, I mean, you know, this isn't a bi this isn't binary numbers. It's gray code, so, so so these aren't powers. But but I kept the same ordering. So so G zero, G one, G two are least significant, and most significant. Um, so and actually, that kind of brings to mind um, there was an appendix on our chapter twelve here that I'm going to go to next about big Indian versus little Indian. That was the program I was trying to work on, but um, we'll have to do that next time. Or maybe I'll just post that. But um, anyway, this is kind of, um, you know, kind of a little example of that, you know, how you label the um, indexes or, or how, how you think of the layout the, of the least significant to the most significant uh, bits in this case, bits in your um, representations here. Um, okay, yeah, so unless somebody has some questions, anybody um, wanted to ask any questions if you've done anything on the problem set uh, about a particular one of those that you, yeah. Professor, I have a doubt regarding the fourth question, D. Okay. 
simplified expression. Uh, um, um, so uh, is one of, them, one of them in particular that you think might be wrong or just in general? I got a different answer, so I just wanted to discuss with you. Okay, oh, okay sure. Um, what, you said 4B? Not B, Professor, D. Oh, D, D. Uh, Oh, the uh, oh, the simplifies. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean these. Oh, um, and that's a good point because th these could be expressed slightly different ways. So, for example, um, so so I showed for Z one, I showed um, that I, I I circled this group of eight, um, and that gives you the um, uh, the the X one here. So my my numbers here are I, I didn't color code or anything. This kind of tries to give you a hint where these are coming from. So this is one from the group of eight. So for a lot of these, um, that's relatively easy. That resolved down to X1, because basically when X1 is true, since you have a lot of don't cares, um, if, if your um, digit eight and nine are true, you can just use X1 to catch the digit eight and nine, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but the other ones go to the four groups. So, so like on this one, um, it, it probably is a little bit incorrect if you don't get the, the biggest groups you can. And it's easy to miss one of the biggest groups here for Z1 because there's a sneaky one that gets all four corners, but that is contiguous if you wrap both around top and bottom and left and right. Uh, but yet, even for this one, you know, I mean, you could have selected this one to get the, this last bit that you couldn't get into any four um, or this, or you could have done it this way, or you could have wrapped it around from here to the, the don't care. That would give you a slightly different possibility for some of these things. Um, although if you got your truth table, you should get the right on. So yeah, go ahead. Instead of the fourth term, I got uh, X2 bar X3, Professor. For Z1? Yeah. yeah. Instead of the last term, uh -huh. the expression, I got X2 bar X3 because I grouped the top two ones and the do down two do don't care as a group. Oh, yep, you're right. So, and in fact, that gives you that I would consider that a simpler expression. So, yeah, that, that makes another group of four that can get that one. So, you're absolutely right. So, so you can ask to simplify this fourth term uh, even more. So, yeah, yes. good catch. But yeah, okay. But yeah, if, if that wasn't the case, though, um, like I was saying, um, so some of these others, there might be, like I was saying, um, a different way that you could group a single or a singleton um, as a two. Um, but yeah, in general, the 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 smallest form you should get. It, I mean. You want to have as few of these terms as possible. That that comes from getting the biggest groups, um, as well as you want to have as small a number of uh, terms in each one of these. And, and that also would come if you're using the Carnell maps from getting the the uh, most terms possible in each one of your groups. So, um, one of these, the Z six, is um, um, is another good kind of example because. For Z6, if I did it right for the, the truth table, it's only false on one particular place. So instead of doing the groupings, which you can, I mean, you can get like a, a, an eight here and an eight here. I didn't circle those, I should have, but yeah, you get a, th these eight and then these eight and then these eight and then these eight, and that would give you X1, X2, not X3 and X4. But it's almost easier just to do the not. So, so, so this one comes out to not x1, not x2, x3, and not x4. But then the not of that would give you your z6 term, just that one location. But by De Morgan's theorem again, you know the, the, these are equivalent if you if you apply the the De Morgan's um, um, relationship here. Professor, I got only three terms for Z6, Professor. <laughs> Did you find another one that was easier? Um, yeah, um, I grouped uh, the first two columns as one, um, second and third column as other group. Right. And second and third rows as other group. Right. 
So in that way, we get only three terms. That's true, right? Yeah, you're right, that should work too. So yeah, so that should be even simpler. So I have to go back and do those two things, but uh, yeah, good, good. <laughs> you, you definitely have got the ideas on that. So. All right, good. Yeah, I'll correct, or I'll, I'll check those out, but I'll correct those. I think you're right on both of them. I think you're definitely right on the first one. Um, and, and yeah, you're, you're right on that one too. So. All right. Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, there, that's up anyway, finally, for anybody else that wants to look at those. So yeah, this week we're working on um, construction set, the uh, characteristics and functions. Um, this is actually the, the start of, of, our, of our fourth section um, of our textbook here. Oops, did I lose? Oh, there it is. Um, so yeah, the, the, and this is gonna be kind of basically our last, um, you know, we've only got like, what, three weeks or so to go here, including this week. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, the, our, our last uh, uh, four or five chapters are kind of diving down into um, the, um, the, the central processing unit. So, you know, um, looking at um, the instruction set um, and then addressing, uh, so even more about address modes that we talked a little bit about in this first chapter. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's a whole chapter on reduced instruction set. Um, we, we might not, we probably won't go over the, um, well, I, I wouldn't mind going over chapter 16 as well, but um, um, uh, we'll see here. So, but I might do two chapters here um, to get 14 and 15. So at least we can also talk a little bit about the risk computers. Um, So there's a couple of things that um, I wanted to point out in this chapter, although yeah, tonight might not be too long of a night. This chapter wasn't as much as the previous chapter. Um, so this is definitely an important one. Um, the, yeah, the instruction set is one of the, the I mean, it is the, the most visible portion of the underlying machine to programmers. Um, although, you know, lots of people, you know, uh, I mean, even more today than ever before, uh, never see stuff down at the machine level or the assembly language level, right? Uh, unless you do it in a course. Um, um, not a lot of people have to be down working um, at that level at the assembly language. But uh, even so, you know, if you exclusively do all of your programming or professional kind of work in, in technology um, at using high level languages, um, the, 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 you know, the, the characteristics and the design decisions that go into the instruction set will still, um, you know, impact you, you know, they, they impact kind of the compilers that you use and um, the way things work and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, the instruction set, uh, everybody probably knows what I mean by an API. If, if you've done programming or, or hung around, um, 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 technical classes, you know, computer science classes, um, so we, we talk about APIs, uh, um, um, uh, interfaces a lot. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of a fundamental thing in order to uh, 
to, to, to work on complex problems. You, you have to have well-defined interfaces so that you can build abstractions and then you know, build things on top of those without having to know all the details of the black boxes underneath. And, and that comes out naturally as, as having some sort of an API that hides the details of the implementation, right? So the, the instruction set um, in many ways is like an API. It, it's, the, um, it's the interface by which the, the software side of the world um, interacts with the hardware design. Right, it's where, where the rubber meets the road between people doing software and people doing hardware. Right, so the hardware engineer has an instruction set um, architecture, an ISA, um, and, and those are kind of what defines x86, 64, uh, slash AMD instruction set for the Intel uh, versus the RISC instruction set. Um, and a large part of implementing the, the processor hardware um, is you know, implementing that API defined by the instruction set. So how you do that, so, so if you have a multiply instruction, how you implement it in hardware by your circuits, you know, whether you use um, you know, a series of, of adders um, um, and uh, using boost algorithm or whatever, um, you can possibly do it different ways, but as long as it gets the result that's defined by the interface, then you know um, um, that's what that, that's the hardware engineer's kind of purview of, of laying out the hardware circuits um, to implement the instructions at them. Um, so describing that and understanding that goes a long way towards explaining the computer's process. Not everything, but it's a lot of, of the functioning of a processor. Um, um, so there's a lot of this, this chapter. I don't know if, um, I mean, I know that um, if you've taken 516, I believe that you guys do some assembly uh, in that course, uh, but if you've never done it before, so, so there's there's a lot of stuff in this chapter, which is really about you know assembly language or machine language. So, so you get a little bit about the details of, of how it works at that level um, and some examples and, um, and and some differences between you know. So, so there are some specific uh, discussion in this chapter of, of x86. Um, instruction set um, and, and, and risk instruction set um, um, architectures here. So, so the instruction set is the collection of instructions that the processor can execute. Um, uh, we should first talk about the elements of the machine instruction. So, um, um, so we've had a similar example like this all the way back to the beginning of the course when we had like a hypothetical machine. So we talked a little bit about the idea of the uh, format um, of the elements of the, the, the machine instructions. So at their most basic, you know, uh, a machine instruction is an operation. Um, so you have to have something that identifies the operation. Um, so that's going to be some number of, of bits. Uh, so new, usually we just assign a number to each operation that we want to implement um, in our machine. So maybe, you know, binary, like if, we, if we're using four bits for the app code, we might assign zero, you know, the bit code zero, 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 zero to be add um, and, and binary one to be subtract and so on. Right? And of course, the number of bits that are set aside for the opcode determines the maximum number of, of operations you can have in your instruction set, right? So for four bits at most, we can define, you know, have, have 16 instructions in our instruction set. Uh, here. Um, now every instruction needs to have um, things that it operates on. So, some sorts of operations maybe only need one thing to operate on. So like, um, taking the negative of a number, you only need one operand or negating a number if it's like a Boolean not, 
right? Or, or negating the bits. Uh, but a lot of operate, operands have two. Uh, you, can have, you, can, you can certainly think of operations as having two or more. So, so it's certainly easy to think of, of, of any of the operations as, as um, um, like, you know, I could take the sum of, 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 a, of a list of items, right? But normally we restrict ourselves to like uh, um, two operands at most. So, 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 so two inputs to do the operation on, right? Because you don't really need more than two. If, if, you, if you have a whole list of numbers you need to add up, um, you can just write a loop to, to, to you know, start with, a, with a accumulator set to zero, um, add your first number into to the zero, and then loop to add all the rest of the numbers in your list, right? So you can do that with any other idea of, of, of operate, of, of operators that take, you know, two or more um, operands. Um, so that, I mean, you have to have fields for all of those. Um, um, so, you know, the, the, the instructions you want to execute, remember all the way again, back to the start of this course, uh, we, we Think of computers as stored program computers, uh, the von Neumann architecture, right? So, so your, your, the, the instructions for the software that you want to run have to be uh, somewhere in, computer, in the computer's memory. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that's where this instruction format is coming from. So you have to have some representation of the operation um, and that you want to perform and the input you want to perform it on, right? So, so normally, you know, we're, we're going to pack that uh, some way into one word or two word or three words of our machine, whatever our word size is, right? Um, oh, and, and there can be a fourth um, operand. So, so besides the inputs, you have to store the results. So the result has to go somewhere. Um, So, so you can have an explicit result field, result operand reference. Um, oh, and, and, and there's even one more. So, uh, so there's potentially five um, fields that you need for your um, uh, instruction format. Um, so some instructions uh, might need to give a reference for the next instruction to process, okay, so, so the next instruction to fetch and execute, right? Um, now this, this one um, in particular is, is somewhat special case because most instructions have an implied next instruction, which is just to, to execute the, the, the instruction after the current one that we're, we're executing. So for all of those, you really don't need the next instruction reference as, as a separate field. Only instructions that are, um, as we've talked about previously uh, in this course, so instructions that, that, that change the flow of control of, of your program. So like the jump instruction. So in that case, often though, for, for those kinds of instructions, you don't really, it, it, it's not like an operation on two operands. It's, it's normally um, um, some sort of a branch or a jump um, or a call, procedure call, uh, where you just need one, kind of like an operand, but but uh, which is the the next reference. Uh, so like an absolute jump is the just going to be an address, which is the next place to jump to, um, or it could be like an integer, which is like a relative address. So, so jump you know ten bytes forward from the current program counter to do the jump. Um, So um, all of these, uh, especially the source and result operands, can kind of be in one in, in one of four places. Um, so um, they, they could be out in main memory, so in RAM. We're kind of ignoring cache here because we think of it being in main memory as it's, it's in RAM, or maybe it's, it's, it's down in a level one, level two, level three cache. But um, from the processor point of view, the, the cache is kind of um, invisible 
the, the hardware takes care of that. So, so if there's a reference to something memory, um, um, it just gets it from memory or, or the cache level if it's cached in there currently. Um, it can be in a register that is different from memory, right? So, so, so main memory is a just a big array of, of words that are addressable by a memory address. Registers are specific. We talked a little bit about these previously. Um, they, but they are on the CPU itself, so they are implemented. Um, um, they're they're implemented as um, um, flip flops, um, like we talked about uh, last week. Um, So besides being in register of memory, the, 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 the operand could be immediate. So, so most of the time, you know, th these are memory addresses um, and um, we're, we're going somewhere else to get, you know, the operand that we want to perform on, right? Um, but, you know, it can be just like an immediate value. It's kind of like having a constant in a high level program. So, so, so instead of being a memory address, this could be just the actual value that you need to Perform the operation on, you know. So, so add, uh, you know, like maybe it's five. If we need to add five to a register or something like that, um, or it can be an I/O device. Um, although, again, you know, um, lots of times, if you're using something like memory mapped I/O, this will just be uh, there. Won't really be a special kind of thing for I/O devices. It just looks like an, another memory address. If you want to do something that maps and, and, and fetches or, or retrieves from um, an I/O device, um, um, so anyway, um, an instruction is represented as a sequence of bits. Um, um, the, the, the bits are divided into uh, some number of fields. These don't, the, the, the um, instruction doesn't have to fit into one, a single word, all right? So for modern Intel and um, RISC um, architectures, um, you know, it, it, it's not that you just have eight bits. And in fact, you usually, you have three or four, and, and also it varies, okay? So, so certain op, Certain operations, certain opcodes might only use two words. Some opcodes need three words to, to store the, the, the opcode and the references. Some opcodes use four. I don't know if, if Intel, uh, I mean, it's been a while since I've done any or since I've looked at any um, Intel assembly. Um, I don't know what the biggest is. I, I know that there's variable sizes for the number of words for the instruction format. Um, um, from two up to like four or maybe five. I don't know if it goes all the way up to five words. Uh, risk is a little bit more um, normalized. So uh, I think we talked a little bit about that in this chapter here. So. Um, so anyway, if you ever do any assembly language as opposed to machine language, um, uh, I mean, pure machine language is really just the bits the, or, or, or hex. And it's really just the, the, the ones and zeros um, that these represent. So, so, so there is um, assembly language, um, which is a, a kind of representation. So it is, it is a, a slight abstraction of actual machine language where we represent the opcodes and the operands symbolically. So, so, you know, instead of memorizing and, and typing in, you know, 0001 or, or one, if, you, if I want an add opcode, um, I use an assembler um, and I use a plain text file to uh, write assembly code using these opcode mnemonics and mnemonics for my operands. Uh, and the assembler can, um, um, pretty directly translate this into a binary representation of the bit layout that you need for like your instruction format. So it can get loaded into memory and then start executing. Um, 
Um, okay, so so there, there's there's a couple of different basic instruction types. Uh, four basic instruction types that are. Um, textbook talks about, uh, but before we go into that, you know, so here's kind of a good example. So con consider a high level um, language. Uh, so so a, a statement or an expression in a high level language. We've never thought about this before. Um, so like X equals X plus Y. So you can write a statement like that with slight changes in syntax and like C, Java, Python, lots of languages. Might need a semicolon on the end or some other little syntactic differences, but so this is a representation in some high level language that means, so, so we've assumed that somewhere X and Y are representing variables. Um, so probably previous to the statement, some, some things have already happened that we haven't shown here. So some memory has actually been assigned and allocated um, for the variable X and Y that and, and, and also, you know, for this statement to not be like a bug, uh, you, some, something has been, there's actual real values have been initialized or have been put into X and Y. Right? So when we get to this statement, all we know is that X is, is somewhere in memory, probably, in, probably assigned to a memory address when, once we get to the point of actually executing these instructions um, on a real computer. Like, like X might be at memory address 1000. That was just what it got assigned by the compiler or the assembler or whatever, um, or the operating system when you allocated memory for the process. Um, and Y might be at a different location in memory, say 2000, something like that. So that, that's just the memory address um, and, and whatever they, the values that they have have been put into those memory addresses, 1000 and 2000. So X could have a value of 10 and Y could have a value of 20. So, and, and again, like we talked about, what, two weeks ago, those values would have had to been put into the, the memory addresses in the correct representation. So if these are unsigned integers, you'd have to have the correct bit pattern for an unsigned integer add. If these were signed integers, you'd have to have a two's complement, right? Um, So if we assume, um, we'll talk about this in just a second. So if we assume something like um, an architecture that uses a two operand, so a, what's called a two address um, instruction set. Um, and we assume ba a basic set of, of um, op codes. So, so most, whether you're RISC or CISC have basic things like load, uh, add, subtract, uh, load and store. Um, we might, a compiler might translate this high level instruction into assembly language that looks something like this, right? So again, I didn't show, like if this was a typed language like C, you would have first had to declare, like say X and Y were an integer, and then you would have had to initiate, I probably should, I probably should put that up there um, to make this more explicit. We probably have to assign X a value of something like a. Um, this is supposed to represent the, the memory addresses. So mem maybe X got a, a allocated memory address 1000 and Y memory address 1004. And then if I assign a value like 10 into X, I'd have to put the bit pattern for 10 starting at memory address 1000. Um, so, so that stuff isn't shown here, but, but, but that would have actually been. Um, part of the, from the compiler, the compiler would have had to put that code in there for like your assignment statements. So this is like the code for the, um, uh, the allocation of, of the locations of the X and Y variables here. Um, so anyway, uh, to, to perform a high level addition like this um, as assembly, you'd have to do something like, um, let's say we have a single register, A, or a single accumulator called A. Um, you, could, you could do this addition by, by first loading uh, the value from X into A, right? So this is often the format for two address um, 
uh, instruction sets, I believe, if I remember right. You know, so you put the 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 the, the target uh, um, for the first one, and you put the, the source upper end for the second one. Um, so for the load instruction, um, yeah, the, the the first operand ends up being um, so. There's two operands here for for the load operator. But yeah, the first one in, ends up being where you want it to go from, and the second one ends up being the source. Right. So in this case, we have to do a memory read, assuming this is like a main memory address one thousand. So a transfer has to occur to get whatever the bits are in memory address 1000 and get it into the accumulator A. That, that's what happens by executing this first instruction. Um, and then, okay, what I was gonna say is for a two address instructions um, set, often the, uh, the so, so that, that, that was true for the first one here as well, but, but, but it, it's, it's um, it's obvious here on the second one. So, so the, the first operand here often uh, performs the function both of the first operand, but also of the um, um, of, of the result reference. I should have gone up here. Right? So, um, so yeah, back to the list. This list here, right? Um, so for this two address um, instruction set, uh, we don't have an explicit result operand. We've just got two operands, uh, and those two oper operands for the add act as the um, um, the two input or the two source operands. So we're going to add a plus y, and then a is also the implicit, the implied uh, result. So whatever the result of that addition gets stored back into a, right? So after that, we, we've now got the, the result of adding X plus Y together, um, and, and that result's been stored in the A. But we're not really done because we, we really want the result to end up back in memory for our variable X, right? So we have to do one final, do a store. So, so this will transfer the result of the sum back out to the variable X. Um, so, uh, so a uh, you know the, the assembly or machine language level um, might actually so I mean typically not might I mean it typically involves uh, many instructions um, for a single instruction or a single statement in a high level language. Um, so in this case, I mean this is kind of like a single statement in C or Java um, that gets um, translated into at least three instructions. Uh, in this case, and often it can be quite more, be quite a bit more. This very much depends on the instruction set. Um, so like for a risk with simpler instructions, you're going to tend to have to translate high level, uh, you know, compile high level instruction into many more um, machine level instructions than if you're compiling down to a CISC uh, complex instruction set uh, computer. So. Um, okay, so um, I think we'll talk about these some more in a bit, but but um, uh, and and and. Yeah, and, and we've we've talked about these before a little bit, uh, but but you can kind of categorize the necessary instruction types that most instruction set architectures have into four broad categories. Um, although, well, so data processing are the ones that you most typically think of as instructions. So those are your arithmetic and logic units, um, and, and and those are implemented in the ALU, um, which we talked about in a previous chapter. Uh, 
um, some on when we talked about computer arithmetic. So, so yeah, I mean, all those things that we talked about in computer arithmetic, those are the arithmetic and logic kinds of instructions, adds and subtracts and, and um, uh, logical ands and ors. Um, so data storage um, tend to be the simplest kinds of instructions. So those, but, but they're necessary. So before you can do any data processing, you usually have to get data uh, into the CPU, into registers or accumulators to, to, to perform the work on it. Um, data movement, the same idea to, to move, yet you, you also might need things to move to um, IO devices instead of into main memory. So this one, first one is about main memory, but again, uh, this, this can be small or non-existent depending on um, um, how you're handling I.O. devices. So for memory mapped I.O., you might not have many or any of these, um, and, and, and you're doing it all just through loads and moves to special memory mapped um, addresses that are mapped to I.O. devices. Um, and then control statements. So you wouldn't be able to do very much. So, so control statements are very important. You, you couldn't write very complex programs if you couldn't do things like um, uh, make decisions, right? So, so uh, perform some, some actions or perform some calculations conditionally, depending on if one thing is true or not, or, 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 or if something else is true, right? Um, likewise, it would be very hard to write complex programs if you wouldn't, weren't able to repeat actions, okay? So, so the power of computers is they, they can do things really fast. Um, and um, one way you can harness that power is to have loops where you're doing lots and lots of calculations repeatedly over, um, you know, sets of data or arrays of data or things like that. Um, And then lastly, though, another one in, in this, uh, the, this for, for control statements are uh, the idea of procedure calls or function calls. Um, so, I mean, all software engineering and programming, you know, is based on um, building complex software systems by breaking them up, decomposing them, into simpler parts. And then, you know, if those are still too complex, breaking those into simpler parts and so on and so forth till you get down to a level that's easy enough to program in a, you know, uh, directly as a function um, in a high level language or, or as, as a, a, a procedure at the assembly language um, level, right? In order to write programs that way, you need to be able to, to decompose things into units like functions or modules um, or objects. Um, and to use those, you have to have some way of, of calling procedures and returning results from them or calling functions and returning results from them. So that's another thing that, that's standard in control type instructions. So these are instructions that affect the flow of control of a program. So the base, basic ones are things like jump. Um, so you can do like an absolute jump. Um, um, I'm sorry, you can do an unconditional jump, which, you know, you, all, you just always jump. It's more common to have conditional jumps where you jump uh, if something is true or you jump if something is not true. Conditional jumps, form the basis of if else statements and of loops. So you can do a conditional jump to a relative address, let's say back to the top of the loop. Um, that's one way to implement um, a loop in assembly language. You can do a, a conditional jump, say forward, um, like, like relative forward to, to implement like an if else statement. So if it's true, you don't do the jump, but if it's false, so, so you're going to jump if, if false or jump if the result is zero, doing a comparison 
um, to, the, to the next statement, which represents the else part, right? So yeah, again here at the at the instruction set level, you don't have constructs like um, if statements and loops um, in your instruction set um, operations, right? You have to build those kinds of constructs, those kinds of abstractions from branch state from, from control statements. So, so from um, conditional branch statements. Um, there is, there usually are, I think I'm jumping ahead here now, I think about it, um, but there, there usually are specific instructions for uh, calling procedures and returning from them because there, there's, um, uh, the, the architecture can give you some help in terms of, of um, what it, what's known as the function call stack. Uh, but yeah, I'll talk about that once we get to that point again here uh, in, in a little bit more detail. Um, um, so what was the maximum number of fields that you need for operands so so, so you know, think of these operands all as addresses basically right um, so uh, anyway so if, if you go back to we listed them out so um, you can need a maximum of two addresses for the, the source operands. Um, the, 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 you have to specify where the result goes, although that can be implicit, um, but you potentially need a address for the result. Um, and you also um, might need an address for the next instruction to execute, uh, although again, this might, this is usually implicit uh, because for, for most uh, for most data processing and data storage, the, the next instruction is implicitly, is implied to be the one after the current one you're executing. So you just go to the next instruction and execute it. Right? Um, so by that line of reasoning, that suggests that you need, um, uh, you can, you could need up to four addresses in your instruction format, right? Uh, but as we've seen, um, because uh, like the, 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 the result um, and the next instruction addresses can be uh, left implicit in your op codes, um, you can reduce that down to three or even two, right? So many architectures um, um, have uh, the next instruction being implicit um, and have the result being implicit, um, allowing uh, two or three address architectures or even one address here as we'll look about as we'll look in, in a second here um, so for the one address um, so for the three address you can normally specify the the two source operands and then the destination operation that's that uh, the, the dest destination address or operand that's typical of the three address instruction format right um, but but that they're actually not as common because they require relatively long instruction formats. So you need lots of fields, so you, so you, so you end up with long formats. So, so I think Intel um, and RISC both use two, um, two and one address um, kind of formats. So, so this is probably the most common. Um, so in this one, like I already talked about, uh, one of the address um, is implicitly gonna be the destination usually. So that, that's how it works, like, like these here. These are all two address formats. Um, one address, um, you can do that if you imply that um, that the uh, that, that something, if you imply something is, is always going to be one of the input the, the operands. So in this case, um, if you imply that the accumulator is always one of the operands, the, the one address you specify can be the other operand, and then the accumulator is also the implied uh, result, where the result is, is um, same. So for one address instruction formats, you just get one address. Um, that value um, 
the, the operation is applied between the accumulator and that address, and then the result gets saved back into the accumulator. Um, and you can't even have zero address instruction formats. These, um, these uh, rely on a stack, okay? Um, and there's actually se several kind of high level languages that are known as stack programming languages like PostScript um, is a stack based programming language. Um, um, and there's some others. If you ever take a course, uh, well, when you take our course on um, on um, finite state automata, I was name that course um, um, on, on languages and automata. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 a stack based machine is kind of similar to a, a, a stack based automata. So, so anyway, for, for the zero address instruction format, um, your operands assume a stack um, and then all input operands and output operands go are, are, are popped from the stack and are pushed back onto the stack. Um, So this number of addresses represents a basic design decision. Um, the fewer addresses um, um, result in more primitive instructions. So, so, you know, zero and one address. In fact, one address, um, I don't know if there's any real CP processors that have used zero address at the, the instruction set architecture. One address were, were, were pretty common for the very, First CPU, so you're like six sixty six zero five two CPU, one of the first Intel, no, the or the eighty eight zero eight eight. Um, both of those, I think, were one address um, CPUs. Um, but um, um, kind of the, the modern um, in x eighty six and RISC are kind of two address, mostly um, instruction set architectures here. So. Uh, oh yeah, like I said, it's kind of a mixture of two and three address instructions, I believe, the support, especially by Intel. So, um, So, so that's mostly it for this section. So, um, um, you know, you have, you have to take all that into account um, if, if you're designing an instruction set. Of course, the, the instruction sets that we have for Intel um, and like RISC are kind of really a process of, the, of, of an evolutionary design, right? So, so especially like um, Intel, um, it's evolved, so it, it's, it's it's trying to remain backwards compatible with the you know the original eighty eighty six and eighty and then eighty two eighty six you know through the through the eight bit and sixteen bit and thirty two bit, um, and, but and then new instructions or new kind of, of things are added on, um, um, uh, but. They they tend to be somewhat to to to, to more backwards compatible, so that you can still use um, the original instruction sets the, the way that they were first designed. So, um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, you have to think about which operations you're going to have in your instruction set, the data types. So in, in our um, previous chapters, we, we talked a little bit about these. So um, if you're going to have, op, if you want to have floating point operations as part of your basic instruction set, you have to define how floating point types are defined, are, are represented um, in your computer memory. So, so but, but yeah, this is not solely um, This is not solely, you know, the like integers, um, assigned and unsigned integers, um, and and floating point types. So, so here was kind of a list of the of the the data types in the x86 architecture from the table twelve point two. So, there's others um, that have to do with 
different kinds of operations that the instruction set supports. So representing things as kinds of pointers, um, binary code decimal, another um, numerical format, um, bit fields, or, um, or strings of bits and bytes. Um, okay, so yeah, let me see. Oh, I kind of want to try and get through. Yeah, twelve point two is just real quick. Let me just do this, and then we'll take a quick break here. Um, So, and in fact, we probably kind of already covered all this. So, and, and not, not only just now, but in previous chapters as well. So, um, in machine instructions operate on different kinds of data. Um, address, uh, so one thing I should emphasize, uh, addresses are a very important one. So those, those implement pointers, um, basically. Um, so if you've ever done any programming with pointers in C, um, there are operations at the basic instruction set that, that allow you to do the same kinds of things. Um, so, so pointers really hold an address of memory and they allow you to do indirect referencing, but they're the kind of very, very important sort of um, category of, of, of a type of operand for uh, machine level instructions in, in, in various instruction sets. I mean, but besides those, you know, the, the others um, are ones that you more typically think of. So numbers, both signed and floating point. Uh, but, you know, character types. Um, so as I mentioned here, and that, as I've mentioned before in this class as well, uh, you know, um, ASCII is pretty common. So, so uh, the EBC, DIC, uh, and, and ASCII were kind of competitors. Uh, EBC, DIC came from Intel, or um from IBM, I believe, but ASCII kind of won out. Uh, but ASCII is really only suitable for representing um, English alphabetic characters and Arabic numerals. So it's not very international. So, so now, you know, Unicode um, is becoming, but, but really Unicode um, is in terms of processing characters uh, from, from the computer's point of view, um, these are really just strings of, of, of like bits or strings of bytes. So some of the basic data types can operate on, on strings of Unicode text in the same way, just treating it as, a, as like a byte string, um, as it would on a, as, as a, a string of ASCII encoded data. So. Um, and the other thing about Unicode is it, it's backwards compatible with ASCII. So the, the fundamental uh, definition of Unicode, the UTF-8 standard, um, is really the, the ASCII standard. But that's one of the, the Unicode um, um, defined um, character layout types. The basic... Um, extension that Unicode does is so so ASCII was all a single byte so every character uh, fit in a single byte and ASCII is really simple it just it's just it's really just a map right so so if you have the the the, the bit pattern for like like decimal um, 65 that represents a lowercase a right so, so all the, the lowercase and uppercase digits were just mapped to a particular um, byte pattern a uh, bit pattern in, in a single byte actually not a single byte, it's, it was only a seven bit definition. So only the first seven bits of like an eight bit word are used for ASCII. And you can do things with the eight, eighth bit for various reasons. In fact, uh, so, so Unicode extends it so that you can um, have a variable, you know, you, you have to specify how many bytes you need to represent a single character in whatever your language encoding is. So you can have, have two byte characters or four byte characters. I think you can have bigger, but that allows you to have much bigger character sets. Um, and one of the things that, that UTF-8 does is it uses that eighth bit of the byte um, to be able to tell whether you're using um, the original um, 
ASCII, or if you're using um, an extended number of bits for a character, so that you can in, so you can represent um, a different language set uh, and in uh, uh, um, uh, some other uh, language that, than English characters and Arabic numerals. Uh, um, anyway, yeah, so I, I probably thought more about that than I really needed to. So. Um, that's a good place to take a quick break. Um, and um, so why don't we take like five minutes here till about um, 8.35 almost. Um, and we'll finish up then after that, all right? Okay, um, let's get started um, back up again here. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, probably the, the, the next uh, bits, the next few sections can go a lot faster on these. Um, um, although um, one thing before I move on, um, so I can at least do one problem here today. Um, let me go back to my notes here. Um, since one, one of the, the, the problems that I'd given um, since one of the problems I had given Sorry, I have a few some technical difficulties here. Um, was about um, writing, um, you know, basically kind of compiling from a high level statement down to um, some um, um, machine level or assembly language level code. Uh, but but uh, you have to do it basically for the question. You have to do it using uh, either a zero address architecture or a one address or a two address or a three address um, architecture. So uh, might be a good idea to uh, maybe just give this example. Um, for, uh, we, we can first, so this is a two address here, like we were talking about. Um, we can make this for for a three address program. I mean, you can actually. Uh, technically have code something like this, um, you know, all in one statement, right? Although sometimes they don't allow you to do memory, the, both the operations in memory and then the um, results back out to memory as well. But, but uh, in theory, you might have something like um, 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 add, Um, X, X, Y, right? So here we've got three operands. Um, so we're assuming that the first operand specifies the, um, the, the destination, um, and then the second and third operation, operands are the um, inputs, right? So, um, so yeah, in this case, that high level statement, if you had a three address um, format, uh, language might be able to be translated directly into a single machine level instruction, right? One to one. Um, now, if we have a one address, um, in that case, we, we're going to have instructions like a uh, load um, from memory. So, so in this case, for, for a one address, like we talked about, the accumulator, that there's something like a register or an implied uh, accumulator that's, the, um, that's implied as both one of the operands when you have a two operand um, operator, or, and also is, is going to be used as the destination of the result, right? So, so for this, these kinds of things, you can have load and store. Um, but uh, you can have add where you give a single address, um, and that's all we need here. 
uh, load and store and add. So for our program, so again, assuming that, um, you know, we've got some value of X, let's say it's 10, like I said, at memory address 1000, and you've got some other value at 1004, and you wanna add those, um, and you've got uh, a one address, memory, uh, um, architecture. Um, you'd, you'd first have to load one of these values um, into the accumulator. So you would do that as, so, so here's kind of where the, the, the symbolic comes from, like from, from the assembly language. So, so again, so somewhere if you declare that I need variables like A and B, there, something happens to associate um, the name A with memory address 1000, right? And then if you say load A as a mnemonic, um, the, when you assemble that, it's going to um, um, replace that with the, with the memory address, you know? So, so really in machine code, um, um, the, the machine instruction that you would have the bit pattern for load in, in, in the field for, for the opcode, and then you'd have the bit pattern for memory address 1000 um, in our one address operand here, right? Uh, yeah, by the way, to, like I was talking about here, like, like, again, if I was thinking of this as a high level language like C, uh, that's de declarative. Um, oh, and I should have called this uh, X and Y here, X and Y. Uh, my bigger program might look something like this. So, so you first have to declare your variables like X and Y beforehand. So again, this is for the C compiler um, and, and many compilers for declarative languages like this. The declaration statement is uh, um, what is used to put um, the necessary things into the assembly language to allocate, you know, to get a request to allocate some addresses to hold those variable values. So like X and Y uh, get allocated memory addresses. And then uh, an assignment to a variable like this um, um, would um, either cause a store to happen. So, so yeah, those, those assignments got, might get um, translated into uh, stores. Well, that, that's not going to work for my one address kind of um, uh, thing here. So, so uh, probably part of the assembly would have to directly uh, assume that we've gotten these values into these addresses uh, like, like we've uh, shown here. Or, um, you know, uh, the other thing that we talked about, that, so remember the, um, um, the, the addresses might be um, uh, immediate values. So there might be another format of the operand that allows you to um, load like an immediate value, so some way to indicate loading an immediate value like 10. So here, this is not a memory address. I'm just kind of putting a box around it to indicate, you know, it's not a memory address. Um, um, and, and if you did do assembly, you would do something to specify that this is an immediate versus a, a, a memory address, right? And then you could do your initialization by storing to get that stored in X, right? So, so anyway, I mean, like the 10 would go into the accumulator and then the store would, would cause the accumulator to, to put it into X there. Um, and then you can do the same thing to get um, Y initialized from this statement. Store that in Y. So, so, so the, the load would, would just load the immediate value 20 um, and store would, would push it out then to, and that would get your um, memory initialized. Um, and then you could go ahead and do your add, right? So in this case, for the one address, you know, we'd have to do something like a, a load it again, say load um, X. So that, that would cause the accumulator to get loaded with the value 10. And then we want to add Y. Uh, you know, again, uh, the, the, for this one, it's implied that um, 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 the accumulator gets the value of the accumulator plus Y since both the, the 
the, the result is implied and one of the operands is implied here. So that would cause us to add uh, 20 to 10 and the result would go back into the accumulator. Um, and then we could get that result back into X, which is what our high level statement wanted, the result of adding X plus Y back into X by doing a store of the accumulator back to X. And the store implies that the accumulator goes out to the uh, address that you specified. So this way, oh, to back to X. All right, so that's kind of what a single address looks like. Um, so notice, you know, it, it takes, uh, I should probably not include these, but, but it takes um, 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 uh, four instructions now to uh, complete this. Um, where it only took three when we had the two addresses. It only took one when we, when we had the, uh, it, it took three when we had the two address. It takes like four here for the one address. It only took one when we had three addresses. So, um, and then for zero address, you might, um, if you want to do that real quickly. So for a zero address, you don't have like an accumulator, you have like a stack. And the stack will be implemented out in memory somewhere, right? But for, for one address, um, you'll have something like you, you will have two special operations that that give that do allow an operand. So you need to have something that says push um, like an address, or again, this could be like an immediate value. Um, and you'll have something that pops, take, take, so, so push, just push, pushes something um, onto the top of the stack and pop takes something from the top of the stack and stores it back into memory. So, so push can transfer from memory to the top of the stack and pop can transfer, pop something off the top of the stack and push it back into memory. Um, so again, let, let's, let's again assume that we've got um, a ways for doing immediate um, values here. So, so for uh, a zero address memory or a stack based programming language, um, you don't really have variables assigned to locations in memory, you have to manipulate the stack uh, to do your calculations and you have to do them in the correct order. So in this case, uh, again, maybe we've got something to push like an immediate value of say 10 onto the stack. So this is, this is the current top of my stack. Um, and then I could push my other immediate value 20. So now I've got 20 on top of my stack. My stack's growing up here. Um, and, and then you've got zero um, address operation. So if I want to add the two top values in the stack, I do just say add. This implies that it's going to pop the two values off the top of the stack, 20 and 10. Uh, do the operation um, given by the opcode of, of add, and then the result gets pushed back on to the stack. Now we've got 30 um, on the top of the stack there. So, so that's kind of how a, a zero address, if there were such a thing as a real processor works. So those are more, um, I mean, they are useful in certain special cases for um, um, high level programming languages. So. Okay, um, back to um, back to um, talking about uh, or we the, the data types here, um, or well the Intel and ARM data types. Um, so I already jumped to this figure once, um, so it's kind of good to know. Um, um, so, you know, the, the addressable units, uh, so this is one of the things about the, the operations, the opcodes that you have. So, so often there's different versions of the opcodes, or at least in the Intel, there's different versions of the opcodes depending on what addressable unit you want to use. Okay, so if I want to add two bytes together, I've got one 
version of the add op code. If I want to add um, 16, you know, two byte or, or 16 bit words together, um, I've got a different version of the op code and so on, all the way up to double quad words, right? Um, and you'll have similar different versions for arithmetic for, for arithmetic floats for operating usually on either 32 bit floats or 64 bit floats or 128 bit floats. Um, so x86 technically doesn't require the operands you operate on to be aligned at addresses divisible by um, two or four, right? So, I mean, you know, you could specify that an address starts in memory um, at, say, memory address 1003 for like a, a two or a four byte word address. So, so then it, that would be, you know, like the odd addresses for a four byte address from 1003 to 1007 would be the, the, the four bytes or the double word, right? Um, that um, uh, I, I guess the Intel architecture allows that, but it's, it's, it's usually not a good idea because uh, most of the time the, um, uh, like, like your bus and other places um, are gonna be transferring data that are aligned on even byte boundaries. So, so typically two or four bytes. Um, uh, so, so yeah, if you do something like that, if I, if I transfer something like that, um, um, it, it, the, the x86 instruction would do it, but it, it might take two transfers instead of one to transfer the non-aligned value. Right, one transfer to get it from like the, the values from 1002 to 1003 memory address that I was using as an example, um, since maybe it's aligned on, on two bytes. So it can only do 1000 or 1002 or 1004. And then a second to transfer the, 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 the second byte starting at 1004 to 1005. Um, that's why a lot of compilers like C, uh, if you don't know about it, tend to align your data um, on even boundaries like that. So if you make a structure that has an odd number of bytes for a particular field or not, it'll often pad out your structure so that everything is uh, aligned on at least words or if not quad words, if not double words. So. Um, x86 uses little Indian. Um, oh, by the way, there's there's an appendix on this chapter. Uh, not many of our chapters have, but you probably you probably shouldn't skip it um, if you've never heard about little Indian versus big Indian, right? So little Indian. Um, although I can never remember, I had to reread this yet again. Um, little Indian um, has the the, the most significant byte. Um, on the lowest memory address, which is kind of backwards um, from how you might normally order things, or, or did I have that backwards too? Um, it has to do with, with uh, you know, if you have a multi-word data type, do you put the most significant bit at the lowest memory, lowest address memory, or do you put the most significant uh, word at the highest address memory, right? So, so that's kind of the difference between little Indian and big Indian. It's really not something that's usually an issue unless you're transferring data between two architectures where one is little Indian and one is big Indian, in which case you're going to have to switch all those words and, and double words and quad words to the right Indianness um, for things. Um, I've already skipped to this. I don't know if this is exhaustive, but um, um, there are some other fundamental data types for the x86 um, operations than um, the numeric ones. You know, so there are bit fields for doing logical operations on um, um, logical ands, ors, and nots, and shifting and things. Um, some things for doing string manipulations, bit and byte strings. Um, there are, of course, floating points and integer and ordinal for signed and unsigned integers. Um, and this packed SIMD for do, for the um, 
the MMX instructions and it talks a little bit about them in here. So, um, so to tell you the truth, I think our, our book might be a little bit of out of date. Um, I didn't check the, the 12th edition. Um, I, I'm pretty certain that ARM, um, the, the, the ARM spec uh, actually has like 64 bit length uh, addressable units now. I should probably double check that, but I'm pretty certain. Yeah, and I, I don't think it goes all the way up to the double quad word 128 bits yet, but, um, but maybe it does that too, so. Um, but um, ARM apparently does require at, at the instructions alignment, you know, so half words should be aligned, you know, two bits should be aligned on even address boundaries of, of, of sorry, two bytes. Um, data type should be aligned on um, even address boundaries and full word or eight byte, or sorry, four byte um, addresses should be align on, on memory addresses that are divisible by four. So, um, so actually, this is true. The majority of ARM processors, you don't actually have floating point operations. So that's another thing that makes ARM much simpler. It makes it reduce instruction set computer, right? Um, although, I mean, floating point is so important. So um, uh, typically, there's a coprocessor mathematics coprocessor that does do floating point. So, you know, you, you're not forced to have your floating point library implemented all in software. You just have to uh, make certain that you're calling the, the, the math coprocessor to do your floating point operations if you're doing a lot of that, um, a lot of floating point heavy operations. So. But, um, but, but really, you know, besides for scientific computing that really does need floating point um, representations and floating point um, computations, lots of stuff, uh, even, the, even if it's nominally floating point, can really be done like an in integer, um, you know, so, so lots of things like um, um, driving video displays, you can, you can do that all with integer arithmetic for calculating your pixels and things like that. Um, um, so another thing I didn't really know, so reading this chapter, so, so um, ARM, I thought ARM was mostly um, the opposite, big Indian, uh, but apparently there's a, um, a state bit that you can, that's pro programmable, so you can flip that, uh, zero or one will give you big Indian versus little Indian. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, depending on how that's set, um, um, it'll interpret everything the, the one way or the other, right? So, um, okay. So like I said, we'll also probably do this pretty quick because I, I kind of skipped ahead and talked a lot about the, the types of operations stuff um, in, in the first part uh, of our meeting today here. Um, so the number of opcodes in the architecture certainly varies widely. I mean, what makes risk risk? What makes risk re reduced instruction set is the instruction set is small and reduced. So they try to keep it to like a minimal fundamental set. Um, but CISC has many more typically. Um, so x86 is an example of a CISC architecture uh, and x86 or, and, and ARM um, are, are RISC generally. Um, so, so, you know, here's the typical categories of types of operations. So, you know, we often group arithmetic logical into just um, uh, data processing, uh, but those are your data processing. Um, you know, data transfer is the simplest um, 
you know, so those are usually like just a load in a store. Um, although again, for like um, Intel, you'll have like a, a, a load byte or a load word or a load double word versions of load and also for store. Um, So yeah, these are probably the simplest category of instructions to implement. Um, the arithmetic logical ones, which maybe I won't go over, um, you know, divide, add, subtract. You know, so th these will all be implemented with kind of the, the algorithms that we talked about when we talked about computer arithmetic. Um, uh, but you also have logical operations, which we didn't really talk about the algorithms. Um, but um, in some ways, these are simpler because you know your your gate. Your, your, your basic gates are doing these already. So, so to build like a, a bitwise and or a bitwise or um, is really just taking, you know, each, each of the bits uh, of the word that you want to and together, putting those through an and gate um, and you get the output is your bit, the, the and for that single bit. You do just do that for all the bits and that, that's your bitwise and um, operator in hardware. Um, so, you know, you've also got other things like shifting. You know, we talked a little bit about those as well for the adders um, in, in our last chapter, uh, logical shifts and logical rotates. Um, conversions, um, I, I don't know if um, like converting pack decimal to binary, for example, those will probably end up in your arithmetic logic unit as well. I, I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe, usually. IO, I won't talk about system control then. Um, so, oh, um, um, uh, we talked about transfer control. S system control uh, here, in, in that, that talks about in our um, chapter of, of the textbook. Um, um, Uh, I didn't talk a lot, a lot about it, but this is really kind of important, um, especially kind of re remember this when you take the operating systems course or think back to your operating systems course. So, so one of the fundamental things that the instruction set does in order to support the operating system that runs on, on top of, of the hardware of a computer um, is it has to provide a small set of um, um, instructions that allow for um, the, the the definition of a privileged of some privileged operations okay at the most minimum you, need, you have to have some sort of, of instruction that sets um, a, a level so either kernel mode or regular user mode so either root mode or or regular user mode right um, And um, typically, you need to use that so that you can change into uh, the privilege mode so that you can set up the, the, the most basic thing that the operating system needs to set up for this is um, it has to do what's known as memory management. So it has to allocate memory and management manage it for all the processes that are running currently uh, for the operating system um, and, and the one of the most fundamental things the operating system does is it needs to set it up so that processes can't see in general the memory of other processes so it has to protect the memory uh, from each process so the way you do that is you need to be able to change into a privilege mode and then within that privilege mode you need to be able to set properties uh, in in memory and again these are often also um, part of the hardware at least part of the memory architecture for the hardware but properties that specify the owner of that memory so that every memory reference when a regular user program is running uh, will check um, so, so there'll be a register that 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 specifies which process is the one that's running um, and, and then there'll be um, something set 
that specifies which process owns this block of memory that's currently trying to be referenced. Um, and if the process doesn't have access, doesn't have ownership of that memory, um, the, um, the, the hardware detects that and a, a memory access violation, uh, a type of interrupt will be generated um, and control will return back to the operating system running in privilege mode. Um, anyway, that's kind of an important category that we don't talk a lot about, but this is kind of one of the fundamentals of, so of computer security, if you ever if if take a computer security course. So. Um, and then um, transfer of control, so, so transfer of the next instruction that you're going, you know, what, what, what's, what's the next instruction that you're going to execute? Um, by your program. Um, so like I said, I kind of skipped ahead. I talked a lot about these. Um, so, th so it's important. You have to have jump and you have to have conditional jump statements. And in fact, um, you, you have to have conditional jump statements um, as at least one kind of statement in your instruction set or else you can't implement um, if types of statements and you can't implement loops, right? Um, because if, if all your statements were just absolute jumps instead of conditional jumps, you wouldn't have any way of testing um, and, then, and then doing the jump conditionally, right? Uh, that, well, that might not be true. So I might be lying a little bit there, but um, it would make it more difficult at least uh, at the very most. The other thing that um, often, um, not, I mean, more than often, so, so modern instruction sets will have a special kind of jump for a procedure call because, uh, I mean, you could just use a jump like into the procedure and then a, a jump at the end of the procedure to go back, right? But, but, but procedures or functions are um, a little bit more general purpose than that. They can be called by, by but from anywhere. Um, So, you know, a procedure might be called by another procedure. Um, um, a procedure could potentially be called by itself. Um, so when you're, when you want to call a procedure or call a function, you need to, to keep track of what the current program counter is. So what, what the current next instruction is that you're about to execute before you go into the procedure. All right. So um, typically, your um, processor um, supports procedure calls by having a procedure call stack, right? Or, or a function call stack. So basically what, what the call statement does, um, the, the call and return or the interleave in the x86 um, um, architecture is uh, it does, some of this for you. So, so if you if you call call at a minimum, it pushes the program counter, and it, and this is done all in hardware, right? So it pushes the program counter onto um, a stack that's being maintained by the hardware, um, your procedure call stack, right? Um, and then it jumps to the procedure, and then the return statement causes the the the. Uh, the program counter that's at the top of the call stack um, <coughs> to be re returned, you know, to be pushed back onto the program counter, right? So the call stack is a stack. So, so the call pushes the program counter on, and then by calling um, uh, return, um, you can you um, pop it back off um, and restore the program counter. The, the, the effect of that is that essentially you can jump into a procedure um, um, from anywhere by by doing call, and then at the end of the procedure, you you um, do the return operation, and that will pop the uh, most recent call off of the procedure stack and and restore the program counter. So that 
the, the effect of that is, is as if you return back, but you don't have to know the address where you return back because the address is, is put on to the, the, um, um, the procedure stack um, for this return statement, okay? Um, and it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, and um, I encourage you to pay attention to this. I, I, should, I should probably send, you know, spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, maybe, maybe I will. Um, maybe, uh, but, 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 you know, this, this forms the basis for, you know, functional decomposition in programming language. So, so, and, and, and this does need a little bit of support in the hardware, you know, to have this idea of a procedure call stack um, to implement things like this. Um, uh, down here, procedure calls and instructions is where it covers this, right? Um, so for, without these, we, we couldn't do decomposing big programs into functions and, and procedures and, and bigger modules and things, right? Um, and, but the, one, one of the reasons why this has to be done kind of at the hardware level is, is you want to allow what are known as re-entrant re procedures. These are the same as you might have, have run across the, the con hopefully you've run across the, the concept of recursion or recursive functions. So if you want to allow a procedure or a function to be able to call itself, you absolutely have to support um, recursion because you can't know where to jump back, where, where to return back without this. Um, or uh, or um, actually, you know, I, I skipped over one of the um, um, describing one of the complications here. So typically when you do a call um, to, to, to call into a procedure, before you call the call, you, you need to save some of the state of the function because if the function is, for example, using, so, so if the current code you're using is using um, some of the registers, um, the, the procedure you're about to jump into might also need to use those registers. So to be safe, um, if, if you want to allow the procedure that you're going to call to use those same registers, you need to save your work that's in your registers temporarily, right? So typically before a call, you're going to push one or more of your registers, sorry, you're going to store one or more of your registers um, onto um, a onto your call stack, your function call stack, right? So if you're doing by, this by hand, you could just store those into uh, some location in memory, right? But that wouldn't allow for recursive uh, functions, right? So what you really need to do is kind of like this procedure call stack that I'm talking about, you, you need to have also like a function call stack. Um, and, and you can use the same stack for both of these, which is what the inner leave does, if I remember right. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, you, you push all of your registers that you're using onto your function call stack, do your call, and then after you return, um, um, the next statements after your call should be to restore those registers. So to pop those back off of your, your function call stack um, and put them back into your, into your registers. Then you're ready to continue processing where you left off uh, before your call return. My understanding of the interleave, um, and, and it's discussed a little bit in our textbook for, for the x86-64, is that you know it, it, it's just so common to just push all of your registers onto your function call stack, um, and then to pop them all off um, um, after you return. That enter does enter and leave do those for you. So these, these are relatively complex um, instructions. So when you call and enter, um, it pushes all of the, the current register values onto the procedure call stack. And then when you call leave, it first um, pops those back off um, before popping off the program counter so that um, the caller can return right where they left off. But that's a very important concept. I, I mean, I find a lot of students are kind of fuzzy on that. You know? so, so kind of pay attention when you read 
um, about you know, re-entered procedures and the call return or the interleave statements here. Um, all right, so yeah, I don't have a lot to say about the, um, the oh, there were some other things I, I am kind of skipping over some stuff on Intel, um, you know, so it talks a little bit about the status flag. So there's one special register usually on most processors that keeps the results of all previous oper operations when they occur, right? So the status flags on the x86 work that way. So basically every time an, an operation, like an arithmetic control operation executes, like let's say an add, um, if the add results in some carry, the carry bit will, will be set in the status um, register. So the C status flag in, in the status register will, will have its bit set. And if a carry didn't result from the add, um, then uh, the carry bit won't be set, right? If the result of doing the add was a zero, then the zero bit would be set in, in the status flag again. Um, and those are what the conditional jumps um, and some other instructions use, right? So, so you first like do an operation like an add, um, and then you might do a conditional jump, like like if if the jump is result. So, so the most common example of this that people are, are probably familiar with um, that that you might. Um, that is discussed here in our textbook. So, so a common way to implement a loop down at the assembly language is to do something like a, a decrement. Um, and in, Intel supports directly like an increment and a decrement operation, right? So um, like, like if you're counting down from zero, um, um, you might decrement some variable, right? Three, two, one, and you might jump if that variable isn't, isn't zero. So your conditional jump would be checking to see if the result was not zero. If it's not zero, it would jump back. And then just before you do that check, you just decrement your index value for your loop, right? And then once you've decremented, you know, once you've counted down to zero, at that point, the, 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 the zero bit is going to be set to one. The zero flag is going to be set to one and your conditional jump won't jump anymore if you're jumping um, um, on not zero, right? So that's one of the things you can jump on. You can jump on either if it's zero or you can jump on if it's not zero, I believe. So. Um, yeah, not zero. Um, All right, anyway, so yeah, th that's kind of how this condition code works. Um, so I didn't have a lot to add on about the ARM oper operation types. Um, it also has, you know, condition codes, a lot of similar ones, so Z, zero, and carry, and um, things like that. Um, all right, um, and yeah, and, and you probably should, you know, uh, read through the, the appendix too, make sure you don't skip over that. Um, so, you know, besides the basics about little Indian and big Indian, so, so yeah. Um, so here on the left is the example of big Indian. This is your ARM architecture, well, um, I guess ARM can do both ways, but uh, uh, here, um, our value is like this, you know, so the most significant, this is an hex, um, so the most significant digits are one, two. So in this case, for the big Indian, the most significant digits are stored in uh, the, the smallest memory address, right? So in some ways, that seems a little bit backwards to me, which is probably why I always forget this. I mean, for me, anyway, it's easy to mix these around. But this is this is kind of more natural, at least for 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 people who write their numbers from left to right, 
Um, I mean, you would normally, if I was writing my addresses, um, I would normally write them zero, you know, increasing from left to right as well. So that would naturally end up with a layout. Um, um, uh, you know, of the, the most significant digits to the left and then the least significant digits to the right. And so that's that's kind of why this is big in, or that's why big Indian in some ways is more natural, right? And then the opposite is little Indian. So um, in this layout, um, the least significant digits um, of a multi-byte value ends up at the smallest. So it kind of makes sense, you know, that you know the least significant digits are at the lowest address value, right? But if you write that out in memory, um, you know, um, um, you know, I would have an address 184, uh, 185, 186, and 187. I'm, I'm inclined to usually um, write those from left to right, but you would end up with um, you know, your most significant bit down here on the right hand side. And, and the, 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 the least significant bits um, coming first in memory, if you do it in the natural way from the, the lower, lower addresses to the, up, the higher addresses. So, um, I, I, I was going to write a little program or I was going to write this program to show this. Um, maybe I'll show that next time. I'll definitely post that as an example that people can maybe try on their own. So. Uh, but, but yeah, if you ever look at the layout, if you're on an Intel machine, you'll see that it is, you know, little Indian. Um, you get your, your values, um, your, your most significant digits um, at the lower, um, sorry, your, your most significant digits at the higher uh, memory addresses. Um, all right, so as usual, I'm pretty, uh, don't lose my voice here, um, but yeah, that was, that was everything um, that I wanted to cover that seemed important here on chapter. Um, anybody have any kind of final questions, your thoughts? Not for me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, um, with that, I'll let you guys go. Hope you guys have a good rest of the night. Um, if you have questions, just keep them coming, just email them or whatever. So I'll put up some the fixes on the um, on the, the most simplest form that um, that was pointed out to me here. Get those back up. Actually, I don't think I am going to put those up. I'll just have to put addendums. I don't want to re re upload those figures anyway. But um, all right, I'll see you guys all next week then. Good evening. Happy evening. <laughs>